that our thinking and our concerns were well known and well articulated, but it has been brought together in a, in a document in a very, very meaningful way, and, <clears throat> and it, it, it is to be congratulated. I think the, um, the reference that the um, colleague Councillor Manford made to, to uh, the spinal road, you are, I think yes. we have to look at that in, in, in the context of what was, <clears throat> what were the opportunities at that time to bid for substantial European funding, and, and we did as a community benefit immensely from that. What we can't answer and what we don't know just now is the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, how that is going to be applied and will that be a comp I, said, I, I, I cannot imagine there will be um, similar compensation and opportunities for us under that, particularly under the, under the current circumstances. But I think we should continue to have these things in mind. And it is important that we reprioritize all of these matters uh, and that this document will inform our, our lobbying uh, future action plans and our, and our future policies. I think it's, it's to be commended and I congratulate all those involved in it. Thank you, Councillor McLeod. I have Councillor McCormick next. Angus McCormick. Angus. Councillor McCormick, your hands up. Are you wishing to ask a question? No, I'll move on to the Thank next invite. Oh, Hello, yes, there you are. There you are. I, I Carry on, uh, My apologies. Uh, th thank you very much indeed uh, for this report. I, I thought it was a very, very good report indeed and encapsulated just about everything you could possibly think of. Uh, just two two areas, small areas that I'd like to uh, refer to. First of all, uh, in terms of bus transport, um, the the amount of money that we take in through bus transport is really a trifle compared to uh, the budget of the council. Um, I wonder if it would not be a good idea for us uh, to seek at some point in the future to have a policy of buses in the Outer Hebrides, including Council Land Road and Barra. Um, I, I don't think it would be a, a, a huge knock uh, to the overall uh, costs associated with the Council. And secondly, in regard to, I think you, you made reference to electric bicycles. Um, th these are certainly becoming more and more popular, but they are extremely expensive at the moment. Perhaps the prices will come down in time. Um, but I think it would be good if we could find whether there is a system um, or some sort of um, financial support for the purchase of bicycles and whether the council maybe shouldn't have uh, a number of, of these in, uh, located in certain parts of the islands. I wonder if somebody like Sustrans or somebody like that might have funding available for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Angus. I think the Director of Assets, uh, assets, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I may, just on the on the fees, there is an outstanding action. Apologies, I don't know if David McLeod is on the call, but there is an outstanding action to look at fares across the island, Councillor McCormack. There is obviously fare revenue generated um, to island operators from the concessionary fare scheme for, I think, over 60s. Um, and um, we, I suppose that would be a loss of income to the island if we, if we the people who are getting free transport the revenue from them no longer comes to the operators. So it would need a bit of thought. I agree that there is certainly um, an area that we could we should be exploring, but there is there is an extant decision of the council to look at fees and charges. Um, perhaps David's able to tell us where we are with that. I imagine that's one of the casualties of COVID that we haven't had a chance to look at um, over the last few months. Okay, David McLeod, are you able to answer that? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, as um, the Director just um, mentioned, it is on um, the, uh, the list of tasks that we're, we're, we're planning to do as part of the review of uh, transport, including community transport. Um, th there is a, certainly a, um, a thought that having something similar to their discount card for bus services would uh, would allow access to either no cost or or, or low cost uh, fares for the regular users who use the uh, local residents who use the bus services on a regular basis. 
uh, and that's something that we would like to do, uh, or at least look at. The, one of the issues has been the type of ticket machines that we have been using in the past don't easily allow access to uh, card payments or card transactions, even if it's a, a free concessionary card. Um, so trying to see if we can get the technology uh, moving forward so that we can have that sort of system and maybe do some trials. Okay, thank you, David. Did you have anything to add, no, me to the question by Angus McCormick? I would, I would just um, mention in terms of the e-bikes, um, the action around um, looking at a kind of e-bike library um, system was very much in response to the fact that affordability is a barrier for a number of people because the upfront price of an e-bike is, is still um, quite high, as was um, mentioned. Um, I'd also take the opportunity to highlight that there is there does appear to be um, an increasing amount of funding available um, for the purchase of e-bikes, probably particularly targeted co at community organisations. Um, so some of the funding that was islands identified uh, was for e-bike purchase. Um, so, and I think from from speaking to people, um, it's maybe using the like of the LTS to help to provide some support to community organisations in making those applications, etc. Okay, thank you, Naomi. Your hand's still up, Angus. Do you want to ask something further? Okay, we'll move on to the next question, which is from Councillor Callum. Yeah, um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to declare an interest in item 10, I think, from memory. I missed that. My iPad uh, jumped out of the, the thing earlier, so apologies. And with your permission, I'd like to, to stay in the meeting as I'm a, I'm a director of the South Eust Estate, which has an interest in the foreshore. Um, but that's by the by. Coming back to this one, um, on page 42... Uh, there's a line on air travel which says there continues to be a question as to the requirement of the Benbecula Stornoway PSO route. Are we building in uh, an option there to remove it per the budgetary proposals of, I think, last month? Because that seemed to be a a strategic question for for the islands: Are we cutting back the inter-island air service? And it, it, it sort of then undermines what the next paragraph about centralising air traffic control. If we're reducing flights, how can we justify the 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 strife or the the proposal to keep? in the local airports if we're cutting the number of flights due to lack of support. So but that, that's that's uh, that's an observation. I, I'll, Callum, I'll stop you. I'll ask Robert to answer that specific point. Robert. Thank you, Chair. We, we discussed air services at the seminar in mid-August and the decision of the Council on the 21st of August was to consult on how the Bembecula um, Stornoway Air Service could be um, continued as a sustainable service. So we are not, at the moment, considering any reduction in that we are accepting that it is likely the costs of running may rise, um, but I had taken from that an expectation that we would engage with partners in health um, and the like as to how that service could be um, maintained in a way that, that met the needs of um, both island communities. And that, therefore, I think supports the argument in terms of the maintain, maintenance of uh, traffic control. But I took that there was a very strong word of the council when we met not to be saying we'll consult on cutting this, but we'll consult on how we can make sure it stays sustainable which I took as a very different yes, stand. Yes, that's the way I took it. Thank you. So, so that's just, it, it's a matter of timing that this has appeared. Now, the other thing I'd like to be included, or if it's possible to revise it, is the inclusion of Pembecula to Glasgow in the PSO format, so that we would include that as something to that the council would like to achieve, because 
the PSO then brings the health service in as a pair, as does all of the other uh, government-based people who are back and forward in the service. It's included in the ticket price. But uh, the, the I'll move on quickly so that I can uh, sign off and leave you. The other aspect of single-track roads, which Councillor Manford uh, mentioned and took a, 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 a quite considered view on, is the miles in the single track areas due to the stop stop start nature of driving. So that's something that we have to look at. And to offset that, could we look at fuel costs on single track roads is to disproportionate when considering a roads where you don't have oncoming traffic the same thing, the same lane of traffic. I, I do realise that we should get a world recognition for sliding past at 60 miles an hour in the passing places, <laughs> but that's not the same. The, the, the uh, Something that I've noticed in the summer is that the theory of mind that people have when they're bowling along and they slide past at passing places, that is continued in the summer not just the winter, because in the summer, usually you get people who are absolutely petrified when they see somebody uh, drifting along at 60 miles an hour in a single track road coming head on. And they just can't get into the, the mindset at all of uh, going faster to meet at the same place. But that's that's by the by. But by and large, we are missing the aspect of fuel costs in single track roads and one of the ways to combat that would be to pilot the Cornish proposals on uh, new fuels or old fuels done in a sustainable way so that we can use them and if that if that could be included I'd be very grateful thank you chairman Thank you, Colin. I, I certainly recognise the bit about locals and passing places anyway. Uh, Naomi, do you want to respond to some of the points made by Colin, reference single track roads and uh, and PSOs? Um, yes, if I may. Um, in terms of um, the PSO, that's included within the um, medium term actions um, in the delivery plan, I think page 64. Um, so that was an action around looking at the socio-economic impacts and wider impacts of, a, of establishing a PSO route on the Benbecula Glasgow service. Um, so that's included there at page 64. Um, and yeah, totally um, happy to look at the wording that we have around kind of, um, I guess, that roadmap um, in terms of fuel and, and, and fueling of vehicles. Um, and can liaise with um, officers there to see what that might, what the shape of that might be. We're still used to single track roads anyway, Naomi, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Councillor Alison McLeod. That belongs to Harry here. Are you hearing me? Um, yes, that, that uh, Naomi, thank you very much for your very comprehensive, um, I would say, far reaching and aspirational strategy. I think we need a strategy for the future. Uh, a, a lot of the points that I'm not going to pick up on some of my uh, fellow councillors have mentioned. I'd just like to focus on ferries and I know you don't have the answers but I'd just like to make a couple of points. At the heart of any um, future transport strategy for the, for the Western Isles we must have an adequate ferry service because the ferry services are our lifelines and unfortunately I think we've been let down recently um, I won't go into all the details. So, I mean, for example, um, I've picked this point up several times, or made this point several times in the chamber. The, the newest ferry um, is the Loch Seafort, which provides the service between Elbow and Stornoway, um, the, the busiest route I believe they've got across the, across the Minch. Now, if anything happens to this single ferry, we don't have a backup ferry. If you take the situation in Barra, for example, 
The Isle of Lewis is 25 years old and it breaks down on a regular basis. And I feel sorry sometimes during the winter when I hear the, the reports or weather reports uh, and the transport reports about the ferry breaking down. I mean, the message I would like to get across to the government and Transport Scotland is just get your act together and provide us with a fit for purpose modern ferry fleet. Because without uh, modern ferries that we can rely on and that can be guaranteed in most weather, our uh, transport infrastructure just falls apart. It's such a key area and it can't be repeated often enough. We need a modern fit for purpose ferry fleet. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Alistair. Now, Naomi, I don't think there was a question there. Alistair's raised this issue as he says at Corla many, many times. And I think it's something we all strive to get something done about. I don't know if you want to add anything, Naomi. Um, really, I mean, I would totally agree. Um, and I think that would be a good summary of the handful of ferry actions um, that we've got included within the delivery plan. Um, I think as was summarised there, that, that kind of sits above those ferry actions. That's essentially what we need, a modern, fit-for-purpose, um, reliable network. So, you know, that, that's that's the call to government on the back of this. OK, thank you, Naomi. Convener? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Naomi, for uh, for this latest version of the lo uh, local transport strategy. I think it's um, I think it's really important that we focus on some of the some of the challenges that we're going to face uh, going forward, and and certainly the lo the the strategy based on the presentation that Naomi gave us has has given us food for thought with regard to that. But the most significant shift for us. Uh, as island communities is the lack of EU funding. And what we need to do is need to get the Scottish government uh, to, to step up to the plate and provide more funding for these absolutely essential services right throughout our community. Uh, and without that, we're still going to be sitting here. Well, I certainly won't be, but uh, uh, people will be sitting here in 10 years time with the same with the same agenda, trying to move things on incrementally and I'm talking about very small incremental changes uh, given given the lack of funding there is but it is something that we have to lobby very very hard both in terms of the Scottish government and also why we have the opportunity uh, with the UK government as well to to build more infrastructure to support services in the same way as they do in in some urban areas uh, so it's it's a really big ask going forward, but it is something that we, that we should be setting uh, as our highest priority. Otherwise, we will be doing the same thing in five, ten years' time. Thank you, convener. Naomi, any response to the comments by the convener? I would just say, I mean, that's absolutely, you know, accurate. Um, change is required to start to move this forward. If we know from that funding perspective, but I think hopefully this is the, the case, the package to show what can be delivered with that that support. OK, next we have Councillor Ian M. McLeod. Councillor McLeod. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Naomi, for an excellent, present excellent and interesting presentation. It's just taken along the decarbonisation uh, route and this is something me as an authority maybe should should be promoting more is there are excellent schemes out there, salary sacrifice schemes, not only now for uh, purchasing e-bikes but for purchasing electric or hybrid cars. Uh, but is it something we should maybe be doing more about or pushing as an authority? Thank you Councillor McLeod, Naomi. Um, absolutely. Well, there's more schemes coming online, um, more so, um, I guess, as part of the recovery um, plan by government. Um, so I think there's lots of things that can be highlighted. And I guess also whether or not that can be done um, in the kind of place planning approach 
you know that it's you know some of these things that can be continuously um fed through ongoing work but i think it would be it'd be excellent thing very easily done just to kind of highlight some of the things that are available sure so if, if i may i mean we we have a a um salary sacrifice bike scheme which we're looking at how we can extend it to um, electric bikes because the previous there was a limit of it of, of how much you could have so that's a piece of work that's in progress though the reality is the take-up has been very low on um conventional push bikes um but it may well be that there will be a greater take up on electric bikes so that's a piece of work that's ongoing i'm not quite sure where it's get to but i can um i can look into that um, and let the councillor know and i don't know about um sorry sacrifice schemes for electric cars but that's something we'll have a look at okay Councillor Colin McMillan, is your hand up from last time, or are you going to ask another question, Colin? Uh, I was going to ask another question, Chairman. Uh, I, I got, that's it. I, I was thrown off my my hobby horse, as it were, when uh, Naomi pointed out that I'd missed something in the report on the PSO. I, I, to my mind, that would be a, an immediate term rather than a, a, a medium priority, but apologies, I missed it anyway. And to me, one of the things that we're missing off and going back to uh, Alistair MacLeod's uh, hobby horse of ferries, uh, mine is the tunnel, and that if we have a fixed link, that then reduces the pressure on ferries. And... I don't see any mention of that at all, and that, that's what I was going to say. But I was, uh, I was uh, uh, distracted by my own missing of that bit in the report. So, if it's something that could be included in the, in the, in the report or the final report, I'd be very grateful, because a fixed link from Benbecula to Nish Point, it's it's something that they do in Norway and Tanger where I've seen them, and when the other people went to. Uh, the Faroes, where their uh, fixed link program is very much part of their transport network strategy. If we could do the same and then look at fixed links between uh, US to Harris and from US to Barra, so that it all fits into the same network. Uh, I, I do realise some people uh, say that we wouldn't, wouldn't be an island or an island chain anymore, but if you go to Sky, they certainly don't refer to Sky as anything other than the island in Chailang, as though there is only one, uh, even though they are still they are now connected to the mainland. So I can only see benefits in a fixed link. And since it's 20 years since the last one, uh, I would certainly hope that we might be well underway before the next one is constructed, if not able to drive using electric cars to the other parts of the world, including Scotland. So so that's that's my, my view on that. Thank you, Chairman. I'm surprised you didn't say that first time round. That's what I was actually expecting, Colin. But seeing we've got one more question from Paul Steele, we'll cover that afterwards. Paul? Uh, fortunately, few is on the same subject. <laughs> I was going to oh, mention. The, I thought it might be yes. Yeah, the Faro's report mentioned in, in September 19 that we're going to begin engagement with communities to establish views on tunnels. So I just wonder if that could be included as well. That was it. Okay, Naomi, that was the final question. Um, anything to add on tunnels? Yeah, just just to say that in terms of what we've included within um, the delivery plan is um, a high priority action around, so in the short term, um, looking at the um, long term connections, um, focusing initially over the sounds. So looking at having that community conversation, looking at um, kind of pinning down what the socio and the economic impacts would be of the alternative options. Maybe it's not clear enough in terms of the narrative, which I'll um, review, but that would include looking at um, fixed links. OK, thank you, Naomi. I think that's all the questions. Uh, Mohan Tang, thank you very much. You've had to work fairly hard this morning, so thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I think I'm going to ask Angus Murray, who's in charge of the 
the whole process. If he's got anything to add, Angus Murray. Angus, are you about? Do you anything to add? Um, thanks, Chair. That was a very healthy debate. Uh, quite a number of co uh, comments made there, covering quite a, quite a bit of ground. In terms of process, this is coming to PNR next week, and thereafter we will be looking to put this on the website for public consultation. Uh, so there's still plenty of opportunity um, to make comments and uh, finesse the document. And we're looking to finalise the document by the end of October. Um, but uh, some of the comments made today, some of them were, you know, um, quite complex in a sense. So it, it might be quite useful to to email uh, some of these uh, comments to uh, myself or Anne Murray or or Naomi or all three um, in the interim, and we'll try and incorporate uh, as appropriate. And thanks to Naomi for a presentation. Thank you very much, Angus. And Thank you very much. You're free to go now. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure we'll be talking later on anyway as we go through the process. Thank you very much. Okay, so in so far as the committee's interests are concerned, the members agree the recommendation at 3.1. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Now we move on to performance management. There are two performance management reports for 2020-21 for quarter one. Colin McKenzie will speak to item three and David McLeod to item four to address the respective service areas which fall under this committee's remit. First one, quarter one, property and infrastructure. This report provides an overview of the property and infrastructure business plan progress and related performance to quarter one, 2020 21. Colin McKenzie will speak to the report and answer any questions. Do you have anything to add, Colin? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll just highlight some areas of concern that are arising uh, recently and going forward. Uh, the first one is in uh, relation to our reaction to COVID and planning for uh, any changes. Uh, it's been increased demands on the resources that we have available within the section. Uh, we have been concentrating on supporting service delivery, such as the, the care service, education, and the, the restoration of, of, of other services, such as libraries, museums, etc. Uh, the other impact that COVID has had on us specifically in terms of finance has been on the income that we, ch we tend to generate from works. Uh, we haven't been able to get onto site to do works that, uh, as we normally could do, so the income that we generally have from such work has not been realised. So that's an impact on the revenue budgets. Uh, the next uh, area I'd like to highlight as well is going forward we have some significant revenue savings targets uh, and we're consulting on some of these just now. Uh, it's going to put further strain on resources both in the planning stages of these uh, uh, impacts and post implementation as well. So that's just a, a highlight just now to say well there is a bit of a strain with uh, what's going on with COVID plus we're planning for further savings as well. Uh, and finally Chair, uh, as you're possibly seen through some of the other reports, the resilience we're having in the terms of buildings and roads has been affected by the reduction in, in revenue and capital and uh, it's something we're going to have to carefully plan for in the future. Uh, I have been attending national groups in relation to both roads and properties and there is a consistent picture around investment and uh, diminishing infrastructure throughout the country. So uh, I'm happy to get any other questions, Chair, on, on the report. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gordon Murray, Councillor Gordon Murray, you have a question. Um, thanks, Chair. It's, it's not really a question, it's a point, or maybe a question to yourself, Chair. Um, there seems to be a real issue with um, maintenance budgets that's putting Callum and the section under real pressure. Um, I was in a parent council meeting on, I think it was Tuesday night, where 
I was told there was no main, maintenance budget for, for the store in my pr primary. Um, it's quite worrying because it puts the section under real pressure. And as you know, if you don't maintain something and it, when something goes wrong later on, it it's probably costs far more than the actual maintenance. So it's really a question for you, Chair. It's a kind of political priority where surely we could... Um, uh, we're all looking for the efficiency saving. Surely it would be cost effective and an efficiency saving if we increased the maintenance budget going forward. Sure. That's my question. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put that question sideways to me through the director thank, of finance here. He's got his hand thank up. You, Gordon. I, think, I suppose I think. it's really a political question, Chair, but I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll listen to you. You've put me on the spot to say go on. I don't mean to do that. I'm happy to help from an office perspective, and I'll leave you to sort the politics out amongst yourselves. Carla, I think, would argue um, that, that we do need to spend more on maintenance. The challenge is that we are faced with um, a funding reduction over the last 10 years, um, we've been under the pressure to cut budgets and we have cut back on funding. We have protected frontline services and that means resources available for maintenance have, have reduced the amount that we have set aside for um, repairing and maintaining our buildings have reduced. We have had some successes. Um, the new schools have a, have a built-in maintenance programme, but we don't have the same level of resources to maintain the service that I'm sure Mr McKenzie would wish to maintain across our whole estate. And our resources are therefore at the MOCUS focused on the greatest priorities and making sure we can fix things that absolutely need to be fixed when they are, are fixed. I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that it would be good and it might even be better to invest more in, um, in maintaining um, properties, but we have to deal with the reality of the, of, the, of the budget that we have got. It's obviously open to members to suggest reducing another budget somewhere else and increasing um, spend on maintaining buildings, which I'm sure the property infrastructure section would welcome, but I think that will be a challenge and I'm looking ahead to next year and the challenge that we're faced for next year and not envisaging that that's going to be an easy choice um, for you to make, which is the political choice, um, which I'll leave to you, Chair. Chair, okay. can I come back on that? So, yes, Gordon, um, yes. What I'm, really, what I'm really hinting at is, is salami slicing, you know, this this approach that the, you've had for quite a number of years, the best use of money. I mean, yes, we have, we, we're given money and we have to make priorities. And I'm asking you not a bit if it's better to spend it on maintenance, is it's cost effective? Because we look at items that are coming on the, the agenda later on, which obviously the maintenance was difficult and now have, has cost us a lot more now when we have to address the problems. I'm saying, is it not cost effective to have an ample maintenance budget so that we avoid spending huge amounts of money in the future on problems that happen without maintenance? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not me that's salami slicing by the way, Gordon, it's we. Uh, but, you know, I take your point, and I've had many discussions with Callum. We meet fairly regular on some of these issues, you know, and, and it's a work in pro progress, Gordon. I can't give you a definitive answer just now, but, you know, it's something we are aware of, and it's something I am aware of, and there's pressures all over the place, Gordon. Sure. Yes, sure. Uh, I, mean, I would uh, contend, if you recall, at the last meeting, you agreed a significant reduction in... Um, in spend on roads maintenance, which falls into exactly the same category as property maintenance. If we spend less maintaining the asset, the asset will not last as long and the pressure will fall on capital resources, which are also increasingly um, squeezed. Arguably, the real terms reduction in capital funding has been higher than the reduction in revenue funding because the, the growth of, of the cost of construction has been so much higher than general inflation um, over previous years. So it is a, it is a um, it is a significant challenge, mm -hmm. and, and and I don't know that there's any easy answer. We haven't, I would contend, done a lot of salami in recent years. Largely, we've taken chunks out from specific services when we've made changes in the way we have done things. But we, you know, there was, there was a big reduction made in property maintenance mm, five seven years ago. I'm trying to remember when it was now, um, which probably saw the biggest the biggest change that we've seen in in recent years. The biggest pressure probably now is inflation complex systems in, in properties that now have to be maintained um, and, and that we're, we're and Kala, uh, 
Mr. McKenzie and his team are doing their best to work within the resources and, and make sure they achieve as such good value as they can um, from that. But I, I'm not, I wouldn't deny that there's a challenge that we are faced in a time of constrained resources. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of hands up here. Councillor Alison McLeod. Staff Balaj Khari here. Uh, I was actually going to raise a point as well. On 914 um, Callas report about the damage uh, caused after Kiara storms, Kiara Dennis, um, amounting to 250k, an estimate 250k throughout the islands. Now, the, the bottom line is, as Councillor Murray raises the point, the bottom line is we're not getting enough funding from Scottish Government, and you just can't get away from that. And, you know, to make the suggestion that we should be spending more on on um, looking after a, a estate, we, we would love to do that, but we can't. And robbing Peter to pay Paul is not a solution, as Councillor Murray full well knows. We are faced with an, a growing deficit year after year because we are underfunded. And we see the pigeons coming home to roost in all sorts of areas. Uh, the coffers are virtually bare. And there's no point in trying to pretend that somehow or other we're responsible when we don't have the resources to deliver what we should be for our communities. That's the bottom line. And I feel really sorry for Kala and his team. They're working really hard, but uh, they don't have any magic money trees. I wish we did, but they don't. And it's not going to get any better as time goes on, I'm afraid, unless we get additional funding from the Scottish Government. Thank you, Alistair. Colin, do you want to come back on the point and storm damage? Thank you, Chair. I mean, there are increasing incidences, I think, of uh, of our infrastructure being damaged either by uh, its age or by the, the weather conditions. Uh, we don't have a budget for coastal protection work, so these kind of things we're going to have to deal with are some kind of contingency measures. But, uh, and I, I think as uh, the director was saying earlier on, we, we don't have the resources behind us and we're going to have to very carefully plan and manage these, in, these things into the future. All I can do really is highlight the issues that we're having and the, the potential impacts and then look to providing yourselves with as much information and advice as possible on these, uh, these matters. Okay, thank you, Colin. Councillor Donald Manford. Hey there. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, working within our resources, that's called policy. Um, it's what uh, it's what the council one would expect to have. Um, robbing Peter to pay Paul or not robbing people to pay Paul is hardly a policy. Um, the language that we used, and did you use yourself? It's we, not I. Yes, indeed it is, uh, uh, and that's what uh, uh, that's what the policy should be directing priorities within the resources we have. Now, the question that my colleague put at the beginning, and again, uh, it's sidetracked in, 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 in language. Um, it was said that Callum McKenzie is put forward, putting forward his argument. Is it an argument? Is it not a fact that if something needs resources, not putting the resources to it and not prioritizing it is costing resources in another direction? The question that was put was very straightforward. Can we have clear understanding of what the cost consequences of not doing one is on another? Now, I recognize there are resources that are short and having the people to do what I've just said is also a challenge. Nevertheless, that challenge needs to be faced up to in order to present policy. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Uh, Councillor Manfred is correct that that is part of the reason that we have in the last item the need to develop a 30-year plan which looks at investment needs over a longer horizon than just an individual year and and um as part of the asset planning work that mr mckenzie is trying to take forward 
that is exactly what we need to understand. If we spend money now, does it save us money in the future? And there is a direct correlation between revenue and capital. You know, what do you do? You spend the revenue on, on on a new asset, or do you spend the revenue maintaining your existing asset? And what is the break-even point at which you do something um, something different? And those are very. There's quite a lot of work, as I think Councillor Manford um, helps me recognise in actually doing that work, and that's something we aspire to do. We haven't made as much progress in the last six months, I think, as we would like to on our future on our future strategy. But I think it is incumbent on us to be able to demonstrate that, Chair. Thank you, Robert. Councillor Charlie Nicholson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm l listening to the discussion from other members to Mr. Mackenzie's report. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Mackenzie and the team are doing a very, very good job with limited resources. And uh, the pressure on them uh, with COVID is even more. And I agree with Councillor Asda McLeod in regards to uh, the resources not coming centrally, whether it's London or Edinburgh, we're not getting the resources. And there's so much pressure. And uh, the department are trying to prioritise in different ways. Uh, the question, I don't want to go over uh, other points that members made. The question I want to put to uh, uh, to, to committee and to uh, you, Chair, is that uh, we did put a, an allocation uh, separate in the Crown Estate funding. I think uh, Mr Lambert will keep me right. I think it was about 800,000 of the second year. Uh, can that allocation not be given over in regards to uh, the priorities and safeguarding the cost effectiveness long term? Now, I know it's so, uh, only a small uh, uh, kind of amount in the situation that we have just now, but uh, the department and Mr Mackenzie are under very heavy pressure uh, in different areas and that. And we, we as members, unfortunately, uh, we were all involved. I think we cut back 425,000 from the department. So is, is there uh, a chance to go forward to help uh, the department and Mr Mackenzie with an allocation from the Crown Estate uh, to try and take uh, one or two things forward in the priority that Mr Mackenzie and colleagues have made up? Mr Raymond. Um, there's a report coming. Yeah, I was going to say that, Chair. Firstly, there's a report on that matter coming to policy and resources next week, um, Councillor Nicholson, and it may be that that's the place to have a discussion about the prioritisations. I would suggest that the Crown Estate funding being used to substitute for um, core council funding, if you like, albeit I know force the constraint is not in the spirit of what it was intended for. Um, but what I would suggest we do is provide you some more information about that ahead of the discussion next week so members can discuss that in an informed um, way, if that would help, Chair. Sound helpful to you, Charlie. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for that uh, response, uh, Mr Emmett. Uh, I, I don't see it uh, that way, that the money from the Crown Estates is uh, bridging the gap of the Council. Uh, the money from the uh, Crown Estates is to help communities in different ways. And within uh, the different priorities that Mr Mackenzie has made up in the department, that's to safeguard communities, in my view. And it's something uh, we need to take on board. And I will bring it up next week, Chair, at uh, Policy and Resources when the report comes forward from the director. Thank you, okay. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Uh, Councillor Kenny John McLeod. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, coming at the end of our line of uh, members, many of the points I was going to make have already been made and, and certainly uh, endorse what uh, Councillor Alison McLeod said. Uh, we're living in extreme austerity in terms of our uh, funding from government. Uh, and all of these issues and problems and challenges we have, prioritisation, is as a consequence of that. We should be lobbying uh, as much as possible and at every opportunity uh, uh, to government for, for this. And what I, what I mentioned earlier on uh, uh, about EU funding, so we're going to suffer uh, quite uh, extremely the, the, the consequences of our loss of uh, uh, access to these funding streams. We, we're, we have to live in the real world, though. We have to prioritise. I'm sure every head of service and director would say that they don't have enough money. Every chair and every member would think that uh, this priority or that priority is the greatest one. 
But I think we have to act collectively, and I would urge uh, all colleagues to participate in these in, uh, exercises in, in, so that we have a collective and a coherent um, priority list to work our way through. Uh, everyone is going to, to be suffering um, uh, the consequences of our underfunding. But, you know, we, we can't just uh, uh, highlight this or that. We will have uh, unplanned events, uh, as, uh, as articulated in the report, and we'll have to respond to these, and there will be a financial uh, tag associated with that. So we do have to have, uh, you know, significant contingencies for uh, uh, these events. I, I just urge colleagues to um, participate in a meaningful way when we have to make these very hard decisions in, in, the, in the period ahead. Um, and that's, that's all I have to say. I endorse many of the comments, and most of the comments have already been made. Thank you, Councillor McLeod. I have Councillor Colin McMillan. Colin. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, one of the things, I, I would love the Scottish Government to increase funding as well. However, the devolution settlement doesn't allow any uh, public sector borrowing at all. So the, the money that they can uh, give us is all set by the Westminster Government. Now, I, I would love the Scottish Government to be able to have a PSBR and increase the settlement that we have. But that's just not within the grant to give because they have to run a balanced budget per the devolution settlement. However, the uh, mention was made that the council knows how best to spend the money and where to spend it. Um, I think when you look at the Barra to Benbecula Air Service, as soon as the ring-fenced uh, funding was removed, the council promptly removed the service. And when the councillors say that the council knows best how to allocate the service, I think they should try and justify that to the people of Euston and Barra who have lost the air service and still have single track roads. The council doesn't exactly have the best record in knowing how to best direct service. And that is a matter for councillors to address and to count for councillors to take the thing on the chin. If they are going to take the high ground, let's look at the low ground and the rubble that they've left behind as well. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Mackay, Council Leader. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jan. If you look at the report um, in front of us, I realise Kala has mentioned the challenges, which I would expect him to do. And there are challenges, but it's not news to us. We knew that ourselves when we took certain decisions. And I think we have a decision that if we do happen to chance upon extra money, we will put it to roads maintenance. I think we've already agreed that without even a debate. Um, but actually, let's uh, have a look at the report he's got in front of us. Um, it's actually on track. Uh, it, you know, it sounds as if it's Armageddon around maintenance and but actually, the report says that he's on track at a 15 out of 20. And also, if you go down, Kala, maybe spend a little time telling us about, if you go to your 7.3, your actual spend figures to the 30th of June. So uh, on roads maintenance, the budget is 1.8. You've got 437 spend. Is that up to date? Kala? Thanks, Chair. That's up to the 30th of June. So that's, that's for the, the, the first three months of the year. I mean, we, we do, we, we are working within our budgets. Yeah. But but the the impact of working within the budgets is that part of the work we would like to do, we can't do. That's, uh, that's correct. So so, yeah. so thank you for that, Carla. So that, that is exactly it. I mean, there is more maintenance we would like to do because maintenance protects the asset. And then as the point has been made, which is self-evident, that if you protect the asset, then you don't have huge expenditure on failing assets further down the line. So it's, it's an issue really of whether we can find different sources of money to spend more money on maintenance so that we protect our assets. The other consideration, of course, is that we dispose of some of these assets. So when we talk about buildings, there are buildings that we maintain that maybe we don't need to maintain. And we have a program for looking at that too, I understand, Keller. So it is a challenge, but... For us internally, uh, as council members, we have, a, we have a challenge in terms of where we take the money from to spend the money on it. At the minute, it is still not 
a case where we're neglecting all our properties or neglecting our assets. It's a case that we're not spending quite as much as we would like to maintain them. And further down the road, that will bring challenges. But we can only play with the ball that's in front of us at the minute. And for us to spend more on maintenance, we have to take a political decision, which is what Gordon started off with, to take money away from somebody else. It's, it's really that simple. But where you take the money from, as Robert has highlighted, is that everywhere is under pressure. So it, it, it is something we need to keep under review, but it's not something that we can address with huge sums of money at the minute. OK, thank you, Leader. Councillor McCormick. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I mean, we're, we're in an extraordinarily difficult situation um, as a council. We've lost, uh, uh, since 2010, I think almost 20% of our budget has disappeared. And the, the people who have cut the budget are the Scottish Government, and there's nobody else that can take the blame for it but the Scottish Government. And you need to ask yourself, why is it that this authority, which is a very vulnerable authority, a very vulnerable community, is taking the biggest hit in Scotland. I just don't understand that at all. I would have thought that vulnerable communities would have get the high priority in terms of funding, but it doesn't appear to be the case. And, and I would take issue uh, with Councillor McMillan in saying that this council has not expended its money well. I, I believe that is absolutely wrong. We've lived since 20, uh, 2010 with increasing cuts in our budgets uh, which has meant we have to take extremely difficult decisions. And I think if you look at the expenditure throughout the island, you will find that there's a very fair distribution of uh, capital resources, for example. And uh, when, when uh, uh, money for PSA, for example, was withdrawn, there's nothing much we can do about that. That is not really our money. That's di money directly funded by the Scottish Government. I think it's been so difficult for us as the years have progressed and the reason the, the, the one of the few reasons why we're still um, managing to 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 deliver all the services that we are delivering especially at this time of covid is because our officers have been able uh, in all different departments to access monies from out with the council's budget uh, for example, in this particular committee's uh, remit, you would be using places like Sustrans to support initiatives that this council cannot do. I mean, I have been speaking uh, with Mr. McKenzie about a project in my own area. This council does not have the funding to do it, but he is looking at the possibility that we might be able to do it um, in a partnership deal between Sustrans and the community itself. So. It, it, it's down to the initiative of our own officers. And I, I, I'm just completely impressed at what they managed to do in these hugely difficult circumstances. And I must say that, um, you know, when I am speaking to uh, people in my own community, they are tremendously impressed at how much this council has continued to do uh, during the COVID crisis. I mean, our staff have worked exceptionally well in supporting their community, and that is recognised. <laughs> the Director of Education, for example, um, pops into the co-op to um, do his shopping on the way home, and he is accosted for the first time in his life by people telling him what a wonderful job he's been doing. And, and they're right. Uh, and they're right. And I think that all of our officers should have the same uh, thank you from the public. Thank you very much, Councillor McCormick. Can we uh, look at agreeing the recommendation at 3.1, saying we've got no more questions? Yes, thank you. you know Next item, uh, which is this report provides an overview of the communities Director of the 
David McCoy will speak to the report and answer any questions. David. Thank you. Thank you. David, you're making a no for me. Thank you. Can you come back in, David? Let me carry on, Jay, and then come back to him. Have you got anything to ask? No, but I just wanted to ask. Wait and see if he comes back in. Okay. I'm just waiting for David to come back in. You back in, David? Yes, sir. Oh, you're you're less noisy this time, David. Yeah, I've actually moved over to the iPad, which um, <clears throat> unfortunately I had the <laughs> had my report up on the iPad, but I, I, I know it well enough. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Chair. The apologies for the technical hiccups. Um, yeah, if I start off by saying that um, for the, the past quarter, the, the main focus for municipal services has been um, maintaining services during operational services during COVID. The uh, all um, Waste and recycling services have uh, been provided more or less as normal. So we've managed to, you know, thanks a lot of work from the crews and the, uh, the, the managers on that side, they've managed to keep all of these facilities working uh, and all the services as normal. Um, bus services uh, were limited uh, initially during lockdown, but we have managed to uh, get everything back to normal timetables where we have a timetable and where we have a contract in place. Uh, there is a report further on the agenda uh, about uh, bus services, so I can go into the bus services in more detail um, when we get to that part of the agenda. Uh, in terms of um, service changes, we had proposed to, to make fairly significant changes to collections of uh, waste and recycling um, rolling out the three weekly collections as a result of the Barvis trial, but COVID has effectively put a halt to that type of uh, activity at the moment. Um, we, similar to, to most uh, councils or, or all councils in Scotland, we're, we're planning for um, that, that to happen as soon as we possibly can, uh, but uh, going from door to door, uh, engaging with uh, householders in the current COVID situation is not really an acceptable activity. Uh, but as soon as we can uh, go ahead with that, we, we will do that. Uh, it is important that when we roll out new services that we engage properly with the community, with householders, so that they know exactly what they should be doing in the future. Uh, that gets buy-in and that allows us to... Um, to, to basically reap the benefits of, of the changes. Uh, if you just hand out bins uh, and leaflets, we, we have known in the past that if we just do that, uh, we, we don't get the, the results that we need to get and that we expect to get. Uh, going forward financially, our main concerns on the waste side of things are um, that uh, th there will be a significant loss of income uh, due to commercial properties, including uh, businesses and accommodation providers who have not been open uh, as normal, some who have not been open at all, um, and uh, that, that's definitely going to have an impact uh, on our income from the commercial sector uh, for the, the financial year. But uh, we're working to try and uh, get an idea of what that's going to be in terms of uh, the outcome. We, we, we will know better once the, the season ends and we know what's what the gaps are in terms of income. Um, happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, David. Any questions for David? Uh, 
No, I don't see any hands up. Thank you very much, David. So, and as far as this committee's interests are concerned, do members agree the recommendations of 3.1? Yes, okay, thank you very much. Now we'll move on to item five, Port Marine Safety Code and Designated Persons Report Monitoring Update. This report provides an update on the implementation of the action plan arising from the review of the Corliss compliance with Port Marine Safety Code. The 2020 Designated Persons Report has been delayed due to COVID-19 and will be submitted to the committee in December. Any outstanding actions from the 2019 report will be incorporated into this report. A progress update on the action plan is provided in Appendix. Uh, Kenneth Morrison is available to answer any questions. Have you anything to add to the report, Kenneth? Is he there? Good morning. Yes, are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. Have you got anything to add, uh, Kenneth? Good morning. Yeah, thank you. No, nothing really to add. Just, just to highlight the point at 2.3 there in the summary that the recommendations which we have been looking at in terms of the staffing that we're now going to, more than likely, we'll have to reconsider just due to the financial pressures which will be on the colony as a whole. So the, I think to look at our, our service and within marine services and the report looks at additional staffing and adding adding to our numbers, but I think that will have to be relooked, and we might have to consider it in terms of what what's happening elsewhere in the call. Yeah, nothing else to add, but happy to take any questions anyone might have. Right, thank you, Kanya. Any questions? No. Getting off lightly, Kanya. Do members agree the recommendations at three point one? Yes, take that and say yes. We move on to item seven, which is bus services update. This report provides an update on bus services specifically used in various service contracts and community transport. David McLeod will speak to the report and answer any questions. And members are reminded that if they wish to raise any details of contracts and tenders in regard specific operators, this item will have to be moved into private. Okay, David. Uh, thank you, Chair. As you said, uh, this um, report is to provide an update on bus services, uh, including community transport. Um, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the performance report, um, we have maintained where we could um, bus services through the, the COVID lockdown and then moving into phase three, um, we're, um, we're providing normal timetables where we have a service in place. Um, in terms of the operation in North East and Barra, for North East, we kept a, a more or less a, a very sort of skeleton type um, service where we were getting um, workers and occasional shopping runs uh, serviced, but in Barra we haven't been able, hadn't been able to do that. Uh, an update on the, the North East contract, um, since writing this report we have uh, awarded the contract for North East. Um, the, the service, the full timetable will be in place from Monday the 28th uh, of September. Uh, there is a, a temporary interim service just for the next few days just to get everything in place uh, for next Monday. Um, but from next Monday, we will have a contract uh, in place for, for North East. We're still working with uh, the operator that remains in Barra. We uh, had um, a proposal uh, for them to expand, uh, but this was reliant on uh, training and qualifications being gained because there, there is a uh, definitely a shortage of uh, trained staff, um, both in terms of uh, the the operator management requirements and also uh, probably more more <clears throat> uh, more difficult to achieve is driver training. Uh, we we need to have drivers who are PCV qualified if they're working for a, a standard national operator for on the bus side of things. Uh, the report also um, 
looks at community transport funding and the way that the funding um, is allocated for uh, community transport. It dates back to uh, a Scottish Government a rural transport initiative scheme uh, that was funded direct from Scottish Government back in 2001 uh, and uh, there was a rural transport fund which uh, sort of complemented that. Um, section um, 7 of the report details uh, what we currently allocate to community transport uh, across the Western Isles uh, but there is no real um, scheme of administration or uh, or standard of requirements for for these um, grants. Uh, the money is is provided more or less on the same basis as it was in 2001 and uh, there are quite a lot of gaps because um, the funding was allocated on the basis of application, not on need. Uh, and you know, as we know, a lot of things have changed uh, since um, since 2001. So I think uh, it is time that this was was looked at properly and the pro proposal was to develop a, a new draft scheme of administration and bring that back to the COLA. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, David, and thank you for the help uh, earlier on this week with the North Hill contract. Any questions for David? Councillor Manford, Donald Manford. Hello, Jess. Uh, it's slow on this. Uh, right, you know, thing. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that update. I'd like to ask a, uh, a couple of questions, please, uh, directly related to the to the the Barra service. I, I, I'm not challenging a word that you've said in relation to the difficulties. Uh, they're absolutely accurate, and everything that's been done has been. Uh, <coughs> worked hard to achieve. Um, I understand the uh, the expansion that you had in mind, that is in mind to uh, to try and embrace the services that are needed and that driver training and uh, all the training are, are uh, extremely difficult to access on a, on a, on a national basis. What I'm, what I'm asking is in relation to the uh, uh, the community public transport type thing. It was alluded to earlier at the previous one. Instead of looking to change or, or, or amalgamate the community transport, is there a way that it can, is there not a way that it can be, that it can complement each other in the public transport sector to provide at the very minimum a skeleton service as you as you uh, uh, referred to in terms of North Hughes to ensure that and of course it can't cover all the public transport you know that of course it can't um, but that it's identified you identify and there's plenty of ways to identify it through the local community uh, about the uh, the pressing need for for a public service which is very very closely aligned already to the community service, but the community service is constrained, but only slightly from it, or it's close to being able to give the skeleton service. It it a uh, uh, that that would meet certain priorities right now uh, until, until, of course, things, and it'll get give more breathing space for the training needs that are needing to be met and everything around it to be met. But it will provide, it will meet the priorities now with a wee bit of inventive thought um, to Try to get them to complement each other. That's my request. David, you want yeah. to respond to Councillor Thank Manford. you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Manford. Uh, yes, absolutely. We we would we have um, 
We've been working with uh, Voluntary Action Baron Vathasi. We've provided them with uh, a couple of additional vehicles. Uh, they have been um, providing the, the school transport from Vathasi, which was also a gap. Uh, we would hope that um, as part of this piece of work, that the community group, uh, Voluntary Action Baron Vathasi, would see that as a way to um, expand what they what their aspirations are and what their capacities are so that perhaps they could take over some of the, um, the, the public um, routes, not in the, maybe not in the sense of um, the, the sort of main busy timetable routes that, that you might have on a, on a public timetable, but uh, the middle of the day shopping trips when they, you know, they have a vehicle that, that we can provide, uh, and they may have access to drivers because it's a it's a different um, it's a different scenario for the likes of the voluntary sector who can do things on a section twenty two permit without having to have a PCV uh, driving license. So we we would hope to encourage uh, and work with uh, voluntary action Baron Varsity to try and build that um, confidence and and build that capacity so that they can. Um, extend what they're doing at the moment um, and you know we would certainly welcome that. Uh, Chair, can I, I can say you, you, um, uh, uh, David you've described very well, you've described perfectly the area that needs to be addressed and if it's confidence and a better understanding of what public transport is and or is not necessarily in terms of vis-a-vis -vis community, because there seems often to be a perception, well, it's a reality, I don't doubt, that it's in this block and this is in that block and the two can't cross over. There needs to be some dialogue between you. Uh, I would strongly, and I'm, of course, it's already there. I'm not challenging that, but to work closer on what would be a, a what confidence, as you've correctly described, feel comfortable with being able to do things to ensure that what is being done is absolutely legal. I think one of the big challenges that um, is faced of any transport operator in Barra in particular is uh, the lack of maintenance um, facility available locally to, to deal with it. And that's that's where um, the, the private sector often have an advantage in these areas because they already are running either maybe HGVs or, or bigger buses. So they, they have already established their own uh, maintenance facility. And I think that's definitely a, an issue for the likes of Voluntary Action and Barnabas. It's how do they manage that scenario where um, where they don't actually have real control over how they can deal with breakdowns and maintenance uh, quickly and efficiently without having to rely on possibly a, a a garage who's not actually based on on Barra, uh, so it is a challenge. There's no doubt about it, and you know, the, all these things uh, make it much more difficult for for groups to just take the step up. Uh, but we are, as I said, we will continue to work with um, with uh, Voluntary Action Barra Vatsi and try and uh, see what we can do to to achieve what really what we all want to achieve is uh, a locally based solution. Um, you know that we we had a we had a look at what we could do. Uh, you know, could we actually provide services from uh, from from US over to um, to Barra? But it, the reality is, if we established a depot in Barra, that that would stifle the the local growth and the local market. It wouldn't improve it. Um, so, uh, so we have to be careful how we do it. But we need to to, to build, as I, as you know, I use the word confidence, but you know, build confidence, but also. Um, work out a way to provide enough support so that um, it, it is sustainable. Um, it, you know, it's, it's always been a problem. Uh, it's a problem. Uh, the, the smaller the community, the less resilience you have in the local market. There's no doubt about that. So we have to find a, a way to, to make it work going forward that, that's sustainable. It's going to last, not something that will, that will last for six months and then disappear again. Thank you very much, David. Colin McMillan.
Councillor Callum McMillan. Thank you, Chairman. The, uh, I, I was going to take out uh, the, uh, uh, again, more of an observation and query on the North US tender that's been mentioned to make sure that the additional costs of fuel on single track roads are taken into consideration on that. And w without going into individual tenders or whatever, it's just something to bear in mind when addressing that. And the, the other point, I've been approached by people in Barra about the bus service, and I've mentioned to them that Ariske has a limited sort of bus service. Could that idea not be expanded to, to Barra so that we provide a service for people to go and do their, their normal, weekly and necessary travel? And thirdly, in terms of maintenance, when you can... Is a, a heavy goods vehicle with transport capacity or passenger capacity rather than a load capacity. Could the local operators of lorries be approached to do the servicing of the buses? Is that something that's been considered? And by the way, I'm really glad that I'm not the only person who's got uh, servicing problems with his equipment and that the the person in charge of the buses also has breakdowns now and again. Thank you, Chairman. But I, I look forward to the answers. Thank you. Yes, uh, David, do you want to respond to Councillor McMillan's comments? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, the, the service provision uh, in ERISK is uh, based on the Community Transport Grant funding and on the table in 7.3, uh, it shows the, the you know what, what is funded. Um, I think voluntary action, Bar and Vatsi do um, already do quite a bit of community transport for the, the money that they get. So that, again, it's something that we would like to explore with them to see whether it's going forward, we can, we can try and fill some of these gaps. Thank you very much, David. Right, do members agree the recommendations at 3.1? Yeah, okay, thank you. Move on to item eight, service redesign, winter maintenance. In line with the Cornwallis budget strategy and business plan proposals, it proposed that the winter maintenance revenue budget is reduced by 250K. The 2020-21 budget allocation is approximately 1.4 million. This report highlights potential options and impacts of savings targets on the winter maintenance service which the department will develop further. Now, Callum's going here to speak to the report and answer any questions. You've got anything further to add to the report, Callum? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to, to highlight a couple of points from it, that with the level of savings required, we're going to have to look at both efficiencies and a reduction in the level of service. The, the proposals we're looking at are highlighted in appendix to the report and were discussed at the, the TNI MAUG. Uh, so we're seeking the authority to further develop all of these proposals. Uh, I'm happy to give a, a, an update on the salt barn as well, which is included in the report. So happy to take any questions on that. OK, any questions from Callum, or Callum from members? No. OK. Do members agree the recommendations of 3.1? Yeah. OK, Colin. Thank you. Item number nine, Bernara Bridge. This report provides an update on the current situation with Bernara Bridge and potential solutions. The report is for noting and the financial aspects will be considered at PNR as part of the first quarter's capital <coughs> monitoring report. There have been further developments which the director, Robert Emmett, will update you on. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If I may, the, the, um, just thank members, I suppose, for in the first instance, there was um, unanimous support for proceeding with the bridge. Um, and work has been ongoing um, over the recent weeks through Cala's team 
on a design and procurement of a replacement bridge. One of the hurdles that we have to overcome is obtaining a marine license. Um, this could delay the project. Um, we're in the process of trying to find through the archives of Ross and Cromarty the original marine license for the existing bridge, which would negate that process. But um, it's, it's, it's inescapable that the application process for a marine license can take up to um, 12 weeks to be resolved. So um, we're doing everything we can to get the new bridge in as quickly as possible. I think we'd like to add an initial recommendation authorizing the chair to make representations on behalf of the council if necessary in terms of avoiding any unnecessary delay um, in that process. It's very clear um, from members' perspective that we wish to um, press on with this and clearly we're coming into a, a worse time of year um, and we're looking at measures to support the people, to continue to support the people on Bernera um, through that um, period chair. There is some discussion in section four about the background and the inspection, which I know was a matter of concern to some members. We're actually proposing that we hold a member seminar um, to allow a, a fairly full and open discussion um, amongst yourselves from um, Calor and Angus on um, this particular bridge and, and, and the background to the works and um, indeed all other bridges in the islands chair. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Robert. I see Councillor Ronald Fraser. Ronald. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions to the Director. Um, firstly, the estimation of £2 million for the new crossing. Is that now a fixed estimation? Uh, and do we expect any deviation from that assumption going forward? Um, second question, are we engaging with ministers at government level, uh, lobbying uh, in an attempt to leverage funding to assist us with the costings of this crossing? And third question regarding marine licensing. I mean, surely to heavens there can be an understanding from the Scottish Government that this has to be fast-tracked in its immediacy as I mean, any delay, in my view, is just not acceptable. I mean, you're looking at potentially April of next year. So has the Cone had any dialogue with relevant government agencies regarding this in opposite matter? Thank you. OK, Ronald, well, so, thank you. Robert. Chair, I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, I can only apologise, I suppose, to a certain extent that our initial um, estimate of costs was too low. Um, the two million figure now is is um, we're comfortable with that. That's not going to change. There are clearly some contingent matters, um, but but the the substance of the figure is not going to change. We have got firm quotes for what will be two pieces of work: um, a locally delivered um, groundworks and and an installation which will be constructed um, um, somewhere else and brought here and installed. Um, so so that bit is in our hands and we are progressing well. I I share your frustration. Councillor about the marine licensing process, um, because if we can find the bit of paper that says there was one for the original bridge, it negates the need for a consultation period. There's a little bit of me that thinks, well, if the world must have been one, then we're looking for a bit of paper to make a point. Um, but um, there is legislation which officials in the Scottish Government are obviously um, obliged to follow. We have been in touch with them. Malcolm Burr, I don't know if he's still on the call, has been in direct correspondence with the Chief Executive of Marine Scotland. They understand the urgency. Um, and we've been having calls on a regular basis with them to progress the thing as quickly as possible. Um, if we have to, so we're, we're carrying on with that in case we, it's unavoidable. Um, but the reason I was suggesting additional recommendation was really, um, Councillor Fraser, just to pick up on your point. If we do need to exert political pressure, then then we certainly will be asking the chair to um, to take that forward with the Scottish government. But at the moment, we're hopeful, indeed, that we will find the necessary documentation in the course of this week, and we can continue with construction as soon as possible. Um, so, nothing else to add, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, convener. Uh, th uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, th uh, thanks to Robert uh, for uh, for the report. I think there is a real urgency in, in this matter, as uh, Councillor Fraser has said. Um, th there, are, there are people who are who are right now looking to build houses in Berna and cannot, because of the weight restriction, easily get them get their materials across a very short stretch of water. I, th I think it's I think it's imperative that we engage uh, 
de depending on what the response the chief executive got from uh, the Marine Scotland, I think we do need to escalate this into the political arena. I'm quite sure if it was if it was any bridge that, that's crossing the Clyde, even although there are multiple bridges there, work would be done very rapidly. And I think it is important that uh, that the it's it's probably more important that the people who live on the island of Berna don't feel that they're being uh, they're being left to one side, as it were, whilst whilst the the discussion on marine license or not. Uh, continues. So I think it's really important that we that we do escalate this, as uh, uh, Councillor Fraser said, and I think we do need to give some confidence to people on the island that they're not going to be they're not going to be stranded in any way, shape, or form. Yes, if, Robert. If, if I may, sorry, we we are doing a piece of work at the moment to look at the feasibility of arranging um, a one-off um, transport to support people who are who are. Um, hindered by the fact they can't get materials on and off the island, and there are there are some um, challenges around that. But we are we are doing a piece of work at the moment to see whether we can do a, a, a sort of a temporary ferry. The ferry is probably not the right word, but a temporary um, landing craft of some sort to get things across that are being hindered um, in in the short term. So that's a piece of work that, that's ongoing, convener, and um, we'll we'll keep you informed on that. We are making every effort, and I think that's uh, an assurance I'd want to give to the people of Bernard to do get this on moving on as quickly as, as possible. We had an engineer from the company up who's who doing the bridge was up um, yesterday or Monday, I can't remember which day it was now, actually looking at the site, and they were happy with the site that they're working with. So so all we're putting in place all the measures um, that we can to, to minimise um, minimize any delay when it comes to us being able to um, take it forward. Okay, leader, I'll let you go before Councillor McLeod was in front of just, Okay, just very, just very quickly to say that, uh, I mean, we've had discussions about this uh, last week and this week, and uh, I think we're making the assumption, I've spoken to Robert about this, that we make the assumption that the bridge is going to get done and built, so we should start what we need to do at our end, uh, irrespective of the, the paperwork. I don't think anybody in Scottish Government, as Ronald sort of suggested, uh, nobody in Scottish government is going to turn around and say don't build the bridge. So, so whilst they sort out the paperwork, good and well, but that shouldn't delay us so that we're ready to go as soon as possible. And if we thought that by today, Malcolm would have, have an answer about the license, marine license, and if not, I think we agreed that after today, if we haven't got an answer, we start the political pressure uh, more intensely. But certainly from our point of view and from the people of Berners' point of view, our assumption is that the bridge will be going ahead and we're going to start planning it from our end. And you're right about the engineer. I think I saw him in with Mr. Gillis today. So we're bashing on from our end, certainly. Thank you, leaders. Councillor Kenny John McLeod. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, I was just really going to say the, the urgency of the matter and support colleagues in, in, in the call for uh, early progress and early movement on this. Uh, I think it's essential that uh, we support the community in Berna and, and progress this bridge uh, as soon as possible. But uh, one, one question really, um, I mean, the, the indicative designs uh, we've seen um, is a predominantly metal uh, work structure. Um, in terms of whole life costs, in the report it indicates a 30-year life, um, that may well have a significantly higher uh, 